The governments can't default. If they do, there's been millions of people with pitchforks dragging them out of their, you know, their parliament over there. Last week, President Biden uh, issued what I believe is a gaffe on his part. He spoke out of turn as far as the uh, mainstream media narrative is at a pre- uh, at a conference of the business roundtable. He suggested that times are changing and that we're headed into a new world order, uh, which those are words that haven't been spoken by President Biden in public before. Uh, something that we cover regularly on the Wigan sessions. He also suggested that it's something that happens in history every f- four or five generations, which we've also been talking about for some time. Today, I brought on Martin Armstrong of, Mart- uh, of Armstrong Economics to help us unpack the president's point of view and also discuss events in, uh, in the Ukraine, given that it's a hot war in what looks like a... Um, in uh, an actual conflict between the West, the liberal Western order, and the autocratic order of the East, um, something we haven't been that worried about since the late uh, 1980s. Uh, So first of all, welcome, Martin. Uh, It's good to meet you. Uh, As I was saying before we got on, I've read pieces of yours for years, uh, but we've never actually met in person. Um, So welcome, first of all. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And also, I wanted to give you a chance, uh, mostly for a reader's uh, point of view, uh, just give you a chance to talk about Martin uh, Economics and also Ask Socrates, a platform that you have developed to help model uh, geopolitical events and how the economy plays out with interest rates and those kinds of things. So if you could just tell, tell us a little bit about your perspective and where you're coming from. <laughs> Well, um, originally, I mean, my father was a uh, a lawyer, so he wanted me to study law. And then as I started getting into that, I really felt that I didn't want to be a lawyer. Uh, So he actually pushed me into uh, computers. And at first I thought, oh, yeah, okay, fine. I mean, back then in the 60s, they were the size of a room, you know, (laughs) so... uh, but we had to do the the full boat. We had to do the electrical engineering side design uh, plus, you know, computer programming. But uh, I was always more of a trader. So, uh, you know, I was with RCA back then and they wanted to, uh, they were, RCA had all the uh, government contracts and they decided to sell the computer divisions to IBM and Univac. So what happened was, you know, I was given the luxury of uh, volunteering for Thule Greenland, Guam, or Vietnam. Um, the married guys were getting London, Paris, you know, <laughs> like that. So I, I said, no, no, thanks. I really don't want to do this. And um, so I went back to trading and the computer skills, I realized, gee, I could write a program that would actually do this. So in the 70s, I mean, we were all back then, I think, really into like AI and, and, and viewing what would happen and what we could do with it. And so uh, that's pretty much what I did. I, I realized from the, from the outset that the only way for a computer to actually be valuable would be to create a program that could uh, understand everything itself and explore the world. Uh, and so you've had IBM, you know, create these neural nets and things of this nature. And uh, that line of thinking has, has led to, you know, I, I would say, you know, crazy theories in, in uh in sci-fi that the computer suddenly wakes up it just you know it becomes conscious and says yeah, right. it doesn't like your hairstyle you know yeah right. <laughs> decides to kill you or all humanity uh i mean that's very nice but i mean the theory behind that is you create this neural net which is um they're trying to you know copy the the mind 
and or the brain, I should say. And then they think if you just throw a whole bunch of information in, somehow it just becomes conscious. Uh, I don't believe in that theory. Uh, nobody's ever been able to accomplish something like that. Uh, but that's what all the, the sci-fi movies are on. Uh, so the AI that, that I develop is in the opposite direction, not trying to get it to uh, become alive. Uh, just mainly I taught it how I would analyze things. So uh, then basically giving it the entire world and said, okay, fine, you know, go ahead. You know, where do you come back with? And uh, in that way, it does things that we humans maybe are incapable of doing. And because there's so many variables that are going on in the world economy and everything does have an impact. Uh, so, I mean, the first thing that it came back and really I kind of blew my mind was in the, around, you know, 1980, it came out and it said the British pound was trading at 240. It said the pound was going to fall to par within five years. And the British economy was going to flip and align with the United States. And I said, what? <laughs> and I, so I had to write routines to baby to be able to have a conversation with it. So that got me into natural languages and stuff like that to be able to talk to it, to say, how are you coming up with this? And basically within just three years, it had picked up the capital flow changes for uh, the North Sea oil. And sure enough, Britain then uh, aligned more with the US and Canada as an oil exporter compared to the rest of Europe that wasn't. So, I mean, it was very, once you understood what, how it arrived at its conclusions, then it became uh, obvious. But uh, my question was, you know, it would take maybe dumb luck or, or a whole team of people to actually constantly be looking at everything. But then you have conflicts of interest and things of that nature. So the, the, the program I developed um, was it tracks the global capital flows. And during the, uh, the 1980s, we had one client that was uh, the Universal Bank of Lebanon. And they had found a ledger in, and in the basement where somebody had written down the, the Lebanese pound every day since you know, the mid 19th century. And they asked if we could build a model. I said, sure, you know, okay, send it over, put it into the computer. And, and the computer came out and said, your country's gonna fall apart in eight days. I thought it was completely nuts. I thought, oh, this has got to, something's got to be wrong with the data. But I called them and I said, look, is what the computer say? I said, this is what it came up with. I said, there's something obviously wrong. And they instantly said to me, well, what currency would you suggest? And I said, excuse me? Um, and eight days later was the Lebanese war. And the same thing happened. We had a client... Uh, in Saudi Arabia. And he was a big in shipping. And he called me and he says, uh, what do you think gold's going to do tomorrow? Um, <clears throat> Iran's going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf. I said, you tell me a war's going to start tomorrow? He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think gold's going to do? <laughs> and then I began to understand that if, if you are going to invade a country or do something like that, you obviously are going to move your money in advance. Uh, yeah. And so that's basically what I learned from it. And even the government with 9-11, they started then looking at who bought options in advance, stuff like that, because basically our computer had shown this is what actually happens. Uh, yeah, and they, they even knocked on our door after that happened because we had forecast something big is going to happen. We didn't know what it was at the time, but uh, they did come in and ask us a bunch of questions. Yeah. So, I mean, somebody always knows something um, and it, it's and they move in advance to that. So, I mean, if you really wanted to see was China going to invade, you know, the United States, the first thing they would do would be starting to dump all U.S. government bonds. <laughs> Well, let's fast forward to uh, to Russian the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is uh, currently underway, 
and uh, and what your model uh, showed leading up to the invasion uh, some month ago. Well, uh, we published, and you can Google it on our site, the first time the computer came up in 2013 and said Ukraine was going to be the place where everything starts. Um, and uh, it, it's it, a lot of people don't quite know the full story of of, um, of Ukraine. It was actually the third largest nuclear power in the world. It had more nukes than um, than China. So the, the Belgrade Agreement 91 was that they gave up all their nuclear power. Um, and in return, NATO guaranteed they would not move in. And Russia said, fine, as long as they stay neutral, we're happy. And then you get this guy, Zelensky. And what the mainstream media is not really reporting, the same oligarch, um, Komensky, who funded Zelensky, uh, is the same guy that owned uh, the energy company that hired Hunter Biden. Uh, I mean, the connections in there are so corrupt. It's, it's, they're off the chart. Um, I mean, Ukraine is probably the most corrupt um, country you're going to see um, in, in a very, very long time. Uh, and Zelensky was, was uh, elected on this idea that he was going to end corruption. Um, you saw major protests in Romania over the same issues, corruption. And uh, so the problem here is it, it, it is really, um, it, you know, the way the, the press in the West is presenting this, so that, that Putin is this evil guy and, and everything's his fault, it's just not true. Uh, and, and in any kind of a war, there's propaganda on both sides. And what you have to understand is that um, when, for example, when Biden came out and said pretty much as long as he doesn't go into all of Ukraine and, and it's just a minor invasion, we don't care. Then the very next day, the White House comes out and has to clean that up. All right. Well, he didn't really mean that, you know, et cetera. But there was a security meeting uh, in Munich. And he sent for some God unknown reason, um, Harris, it should have been the secretary of state, but she goes there and then off the cuff, it seemed as though she then just tells, you know, Zelensky that go ahead, you should join NATO, which is a total violation of the Belgrade agreement. She does that on February 20th, but nobody comes out to clean that up. And then Putin invades four days later. That was the one thing that agreement that Ukraine was going to remain neutral. And here you have her saying, join NATO, uh, which is very, very strange. Uh, it, it makes me wonder that somebody in her camp, because I think she does the same thing as Biden, just reads the cue cards, you know. Um, so I'm not even sure she was aware of what she was even saying. But when they do that, usually the White House comes out and re, you know, clarifies it, but there was no clarification. So um, I believe what you're looking at here is they needed a, they need this war. And why do I say that? Um, mainly because I've been fighting uh, with various different central banks for the last 10 years. And um, <clears throat> You know, I've been arguing that, look, this whole thing is going to come and fall apart. The ECB went to negative interest rates in 2014. They're still negative. All right. They've wiped out their bond market. And then in August uh, of 19, suddenly the New York banks were not willing to lend in the overnight repo market to any European bank. And the Fed had to st step in. Well, the New York banks will not accept any government bonds from Europe as collateral. Uh, why? Because they know they're going to default and they're negative to begin with. So uh, the only real buyer has been the ECB. So the problem here is that um, the, you're looking at, they have effectively 
um, bankrupted all the pension funds in Europe. Uh, by law, they had to have 70%, some of them 90% uh, of government debt that pays negative. These pension funds need to make on average 8% annually to break even. So, I mean, it's a total, complete mess. In what capacity does the war uh, help get them out of this? The real, it doesn't realign the, uh, the debt load or it doesn't reset the bonds. No, it allows them to default. Yeah. They, they need the excuse. And, and this is where uh, Klaus Schwab in his great reset. What, what he's been pushing is exactly this. Just, just to clarify before you get into this point, Klaus Schwab is the founder and the chief, chief executive of the World Economic Forum that meets in Davos uh, twice a year. <clears throat> yes. Now, um, probably a lot of people have seen his eight points for Agenda 2030, and it says you'll own nothing and be happy. All right. Uh, it He's not actually advocating communism. What, what it is, is that they're trying to make it sound that they're doing this for you. The governments can't default. If they do, there's been millions of people with pitchforks dragging them out of their, you know, their parliament over there. Uh, so how, you get, how do you pull this off? Uh, it makes it sound like we're gonna relieve you of all your debts. And we're doing this for you, when in fact, they're the ones that really have to default. Uh, so that's what he's really saying when he says, uh, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Uh, it, it is, his argument is um, basically to be Marxist in the sense. Uh, him and several other academics that I know, they view that uh, Marxism would have, been successful had um, they also controlled the United States and Europe. They, they feel that since we were not Marxist, that therefore that's why communism failed. But th that's just total nonsense. Um, but, you know, the, the academics, that's basically what they tend to do. Uh, they always tend to be more left leaning. Uh, so you're looking at that is the ultimate real uh, problem they have. And the war, these people think that like after World War II, you had Brent Woods and then you reestablished the, you know, the world monetary system. And so they really think that they're going to be able to pull off Brent Woods too here. Uh, and but I think they also think that they can keep this thing conventional, et cetera. And the other problem they've had was that there were three major obstacles to this. And that was one was Donald Trump because he was against the whole climate change, et cetera. Uh, so basically they got rid of him. The next one is Putin. And the third is, is uh, Jing in, in China. So they feel that if they can um, cause regime change over there that it would be better, but I mean, uh, that they might be able to get, you know, Russia back into their fold. I just don't see that as happening. Uh, and our computer basically says that they're going to fail. Yeah. Uh, well, the computer, you, the last you mentioned, it was uh, the model showed in 2013 that uh, the beginning would start in Ukraine. And in fact, in 2014, that's when China first and next, the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, just maybe connect the dots between what, what the model was saying uh, in 2013 and then what actually happened in 2014. Yeah, the, Because the, that's a precursor. If you talk to any Ukrainian, I played tennis with a guy who's a researcher studying here at the um, at Johns Hopkins University. And he's Ukrainian. His family is back in the Ukraine. He's, he's not been in a good mood for the last couple of weeks. Um, rightly so. Um, he, he said, we, we never, the, the first uh, annexation of Crimea was just the beginning. We've really been at a state of war since then, or a state of readiness. And then 
for the past month, it's been it's been missiles raining on uh, Ukrainian cities. So the, the, their thought is that they have been under siege for some time now. But your model suggested that that was about to take place back in 2013. Yeah, and I um, unfortunately, uh, I think there's a fair amount of evidence is starting to come up that that Zelensky is taking orders from somebody else other than his own people. Well, uh, he's also part of the I mean, he's a member of the World Economic Forum. Yes. Is that true? Yeah. Um, but I mean, and he was elected to reduce tensions with Russia. And, and I think what a lot of people don't understand because of the propaganda, oh, you know, Putin's invading a sovereign nation. Ukraine was never a sovereign nation. All right. It was always this this land in the middle um, between Poland, etc. Uh, the borders of Ukraine were drawn by Khrushchev in, in the Soviet Union. Crimea uh, was always Russian. He just simply allocated it to Ukraine to, to manage. The people there are all Russian. They speak Russian. They're not Ukrainian. And the same thing in the Donbass. Uh, now, when 2014 took place, uh, I, I came out and I said, look, Ukraine should just simply be split according to the language and let it, you know, and then we would have uh, a reasonable you know, position. Putin went in to take Crimea because that was a, a very, very major military port for them. So when you start getting into a revolution uh, and then the risk was that you know, they would cut, you know, Russia off from Crimea. So, I mean, it was, you know, you, you just should have let Donbass, you know, vote like the Minsk agreement said, but, um, you know, you're putting, it, it just seems unreasonable that you put the entire Ukrainian population uh, at risk for what? For holding on to two areas that, are ethnically Russian to begin with. Yeah. Uh, it, it just doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, and I mean, if you're into world peace, you say, okay, fine. You know, you do you go your way, we go our way. Um, but if you're into aggravating things, then I think it's something different. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I think that's what's going on here. And um, I mean, even Nigel Farage stood up on on the floor of Parliament over there back in 2014. He says, you are inviting war here uh, because NATO was there saying, oh, maybe you should join. Uh, during my time, there were people waving, you know, Euro you know, flags. They thought they were going to become part of Euro. So it was, you know, he was arguing that, you know, the EU was actually encouraging this. So and you're you're connecting the dots from that sort of a poke in the bear, so to speak, uh, that they're doing it intentionally to clean up their own economic mess. It seems to be because I think that um, if you look at this, even the the agenda 2030. Um, yeah, that's and, the World Economic Forum's. Agenda. Yeah, and Our the struggle. idea is that the United Nations becomes the new one world government. And he even has in there that the United States would surrender its nuclear power to the UN. Uh, it, it's quite bizarre, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's the only way to do that is if you also create regime change in China and Russia. So it, it happens to be very convenient. Um, and often the way history is written, we don't know for decades afterwards as to what's what's the real true story behind yeah, what what the motives are, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, I think the motives are pretty clear as far as if you look at them trying to create this one world government idea, uh, which has been around for a long time. Uh, I mean, they that was even used to form the EU. Um, I mean, there's a clip on my site, which even of the old French president Holland and, and Merkel standing up and even admitting that this will end European wars. Um, and that's just not the case. But, you know, uh, particularly in Europe, I mean, America was different in the sense that it worked because <clears throat> actually 
uh, we discriminated against everybody when they got off the boat. If you want, wanted to get a job, you had to learn to speak English. So <clears throat> at the end, uh, that became the melting pot. So you ask an American, what are you? you? go, well, I'm half German, half Irish or whatever. But you don't really see that in Europe. You know, you don't see somebody from Scotland going down and marrying a, you know, a girl from Sicily. You know, um, they speak different languages and different cultures. Where in America, everybody, once they spoke the same language, we all ended up with the same culture, basically. Uh, and although we're all, you know, mixed ethnically. <clears throat> so Europe, Europe, it's still very much divided. And you can bet you that. Uh, if a French girl brings home a German boy to her father, he's going to say, you do know what they did to us, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been in Athens when they were protesting against uh, the EU and they're dressed up in Nazi uniforms blaming Germany, you know. So uh, the old, you know, divisions and hatred live long time there. As you mentioned, or as you said, um during times of war, uh, there's propaganda on both sides. It's been challenging to look to, you know, parse through the uh, mainstream media and try to figure out anything beyond the Western uh, liberal order's view of the what the war means. Um, but there's one piece that comes through fairly regularly, uh, and it's a translation of something Putin said that they were fighting against Nazis in the Ukraine. Um, and you bring up um, how the the um, the Greeks also believed that that it was like a rebirth of the of the uh, Nazi agenda <clears throat> from World War II. And I've read some people who are interpreting Putin's comments to say that World War II never really ended. We had the Cold War, and then we had a period of rel relative peace. But uh, the motives for the Russian invasion are similar to or de uh, reach deeply into the the Russian historical narrative that they're defending their borders from uh, from an invasion uh, from a liberal order that they they liken to uh, what the Germans did in World War II. The Nazis came to to try to annex Russia into their their own empire or as they perceived it, the Third Reich. Well, uh, I, what, do you, I would, what do you make of those comments from, or it's hard to even figure out what's true and what's not. I've talked to people who speak Russian and they, they say the rhetoric that he has, um, that he rose to uh, forced him into invading just to defend his, uh, you know, keep his uh, seat of power together. Uh, I don't agree with that. Um, <laughs> there, there is a very good, uh, documentary that Oliver Stone did, Ukraine on Fire. Yeah. Um, and he yeah, went into it. Uh, and <clears throat> it, I mean, it's true there were Ukrainian Nazis, but the difference was that, I mean, they, they killed Poles, they killed uh, Jews, but they also killed Russians. And uh, the Ukrainian Nazis were never put on trial, mainly because they didn't, they were ethnically trying to cleanse Russians as well. So the CIA actually protected them. Uh, and that is a true story. Uh, and so they put the German Nazis on trial, but they never did anything with the Ukrainian ones. Uh, and that's what Putin's really talking about, that there is still this extremely right-wing Nazi-type um, view, and they even have their own flag, which is a red and black one. Um, so it's, it, I mean, that is true. I mean, I know people in Donetsk that, um, you know, basically talk about the same thing, that, you know, that they feel that they're a second-rate type citizen. And, and you when Yanukovych went in, he was from the East. And so he passed a law that said Russian and Ukrainian were official languages. Then Zelensky comes in and he passes a law only Ukrainians uh, respected as the language of Ukraine. 
So from their perspective, it's like a real slap in the face that they don't even exist. And if they exist, they're like, you know, the uh, quite different. So, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, resentments on both sides. Um, Ukrainians resent uh, the days of Stalin that, that came in and 7 million of them died because they took all the food. Um, I mean, that was, you know, one of the, the main plots that was in the movie, Mr. Jones, which is also very good. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's definitely resentment on both sides. And, and um, so one goes back to Stalin, the other one goes back to World War II. <laughs> But um, they both have their legitimate gripes. I mean, I wouldn't say it's propaganda from either side that's that's made them up. It is simply fact. That's it. Um, I mean, I, I was in Yugoslavia many years ago before they broke up, and uh, I went to a meeting, and they were talking about you know the opposition. And, oh, they killed six hundred of us, and they threw us in a in a a common grave. And I thought it was something I missed in the news. I, I said, excuse me? I said, when when did this happen? Oh, about 700 years ago. Oh, yes, that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was speaking to uh, one of our writers, Byron King, uh, last week. And and he was saying, if you look back in the history of, of Europe and where the lines are drawn, um, the Ukraine gets passed over all the time. The line moves across that stretch of land back and forth. In, and during the Cold War, it stretched beyond... Ukraine to Poland and beyond all the way to Eastern uh, East, East Germany. Um, he's like, we're just in one of those periods right now where the lines are being redrawn. And I, I, I tend to agree with you that if they just um, if, if they just drew the line where the Russian ethnic groups in Ukraine are annexed into Russia, it seems like from an outsider's point of view that that ought to be a, a reasonable settlement. I don't know where they are in the ceasefire talks, but but it seems like a a reasonable thing for a, but but we don't we don't carry the uh, we don't carry that that historical background uh, like you mentioned. No, it's true. We don't hate hate them for this or that or the other yes. thing and, and but um but but there is a uh, there is a contingent of uh, policymakers in the US that are looking at that historical hatred between groups and they're like hey this is our chance to uh to to realign the map draw the lines on the map the way that we want to see them um you, you know people are advocating that we go in and and take advantage of the war to uh to destabilize russia and i think that that's that's a different kind of uh political uh impetus than what the world economic forum is advocating they want a one world government um the neocons in the u.s they want to see they want to see war with russia just to get back at them from from uh you know the, the cold war as if the yeah, cold I war mean, is still going on i think that's a serious mistake because um well you say it's a serious mistake but but you <clears throat> are you agreeing that there is a segment of politicians oh yes no look, the ne <clears throat> we have neocons uh just as Russia does, that would love to have war with the United States, we have the same problem on our side. Um, they were there, you know, with pushing for the Bay of Pigs with Kennedy, you know. Uh, I mean, they were the ones that came up with weapons of mass destruction in, in Ukraine, I mean, in, in Iraq. Um, even Johnson, you can Google it, I think it's even in Wikipedia. He stood up and said, you know, Vietnam never attacked us. He said, for all I know, they were shooting at whales that night. I mean, virtually every war has been, you know, propagated on some sort of uh, propaganda, really. That was not true. I mean, the sinking of the Maine, you know, they, you know, the Spanish attacked us and it turned out never, you know, that was never the case. But um, we have, you know, this is, you, you just have people that always want to go to war. Um, and I mean, there was, Probably the guy that really created the Second Amendment was the Princess Savoy, who was a very famous general. Even Napoleon said he was one of the greatest. And he had worked for many different kings. And he had told Montesquieu that basically that um, the problem with war is that kings have these armies 
they pay a lot of money for them, but they're not doing anything. So they create war just to use them. And that was his view. And, and so the idea behind the Second Amendment was that we didn't have a standing army, but everybody had the right to go get arms and, and defend the country, mm -hmm. uh, more or less like Switzerland. So, I mean, this has been going around for hundreds of years. You have just people that want to wage war upon somebody else, uh, kind of like two drunks in a bar, you know, <laughs> but um, you know, just on a grander scale. And but the neocons have definitely been involved in all this stuff for quite some time. And um, I mean, you even take the all the people in Guantanamo Bay. Why don't they put them on trial? They put one guy on trial and the jury basically found them innocent of, of over 200 charges and, and found them guilty on one. Uh, they, and that was it. So the rest of them are just sitting there. Why? Um, you know, I know somebody from Congress and they tried to release them quietly and they gave them some jeans and shirts and released them. And then they were killed because they thought they were plants from the CIA. So it's um, they won't put them on trial and they can't release them because they'll be killed. So, you know, but this is part of the problem. Um, and as long as you're going to have people that just uh, want to play war, you know, that's that's our our curse i suppose yeah not to mention that there are a lot of people who uh benefit from the production of the weapons that are used <laughs> yeah we have an entire you know it's eisenhower's famous quote of the industrial uh military industrial complex that's never more true than it is today yeah and it's it's just it makes it very hard to come up uh, and say definitively, you know, this is what's happening because you get propaganda from both sides. Um, I mean, I got emails today from people that saw Zelensky on uh, addressing parliament in, in Italy. And he crossed the line. And I'm getting a lot of emails now to think that he's just absolute, you know, uh, making, making stuff up. He's, in, what, he, yeah, in what way did he cross the line, though? Where he, he, he said Russians were uh, torturing little kids. For what reason? You know, um, and uh, capturing and torturing them. What, what would little kids even know about? I mean, honestly, nobody's ever done something like that. Yeah. But he's like soliciting money. Please come help us. This is what the Russians are doing to our children. I mean, not even Genghis Khan did something like that. Um, where's the evidence of any of this? Uh, and, and so a lot of people I know from Italy were just very disgusted with him. And they said that was it. He, they just think he just makes up stuff and and just puts it out on the air. And everybody goes, oh, my God, you know, where's the evidence of any of this? Uh, and he had was putting out claims that, oh, there's a coup forming in, in Russia and they're going to take out uh, Putin. I mean, that is nonsense, too, because, first of all, if that was true, why would you, you know, warn Putin that that's going to happen? Uh, and uh, they even named his successor, who's the number two guy. And God help us if he's in there. I mean, Putin's reasonable compared to him. He came out and said that uh, Stalin's uh, great purge was necessary. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there are worse people than Putin. I mean, come on. I mean, there, there have been some, I mean, Stalin could kill 10 million people and then go out to dinner, you know? Uh, yeah. uh, so, I mean, it's, everything's relative. Uh, but I, I think even those statements coming out of Ukraine are not true. Um, I think it seems to me more trying to get somebody desperate to, oh, you'll be a hero if you take him out. But then you take him out, then what are you going to get? You know, it's... Um, Often in war, you don't want to actually eliminate the head because then there's no way to negotiate with. Um, so it's and the rest of the people honestly behind this is, is nuts. And the sanctions that Biden has done um, are way out of line and very serious uh, economically. Um, well, the phrase he's been using is he's mm -hmm. trying to weaponize the dollar. And the thing about weapons is that they, in war, they get destroyed. And uh, well, it's likely what's going to happen to the dollar in this case. It's, it's worse than that. It, it, when Obama 
put on, you know, was going to put on sanctions uh, uh, against Putin before taking Crimea back in 14. He went to, to SWIFT and said we wanted to take them out of, this, out of the SWIFT system, and they refused. They said, you're not going to turn us into a weapon. Now, there's a new regime in SWIFT since 2019. Biden goes to them and they go, oh, OK, fine, we'll take them out. Now, the problem here is you've just told the entire world, if you disagree with us, we can remove you from SWIFT. China has been working on an alternative system. And now they're going full blown ahead. Um, and you've effectively chopped the world economy in half. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there's, there is not going to be, there's no putting this back together now. Uh, there will be two systems. Saudi Arabia just you know, came out and said that they will sell oil to, uh, to China in yuan, not dollars. And then Putin very, smartly came out and said, okay, fine, if Europe wants uh, uh, oil and gas from us, you will pay in rubles, not dollars. Um, and, you know, nobody thinks about this. You've frozen Russia's uh, reserves. So do you expect them to continue to just put pile money into there because they're selling oil in dollars? No, they cut off the dollar and say you're going to pay in rubles. Um, and so, I mean, there are, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Japan put in the sanctions on, on the Russians, and all of a sudden the Russians pulled out of the World War II peace treaties with the, with the islands north of Japan that were in dispute. And they go, oh, well, why would you pull out of that? Uh, because you put sanctions on them. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's like. I don't know. If I slap you in the face, do I think you're just going to stand there and let me do that? Or are you going to hit back? Um, it, it seems like we have some of the most incompetent world leaders ever. I mean, I, well, I don't not just incompetent, but they have uh, entrenched interests that they're trying to protect, too. And now all this stuff is coming out about the Bidens in Ukraine and, and the, uh, the different dealings that were going on even after 2014. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, this guy that funded uh, Zelensky is the same guy that would put Hunter Biden on the board of the energy company. I mean, this is all so entangled. It, it's, you know, it, it's maybe it's going to be like the, the Kennedy files, you know, they, they oh, it's going to be sealed for 50 years. Now it's maybe another 50. I mean, it's, yeah. they, they don't ever want to, you know, tell the truth about anything. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how we started this. Uh, the the two, two blocks, the autocratic nations on one side, developing their own system of trade and finance, uh, and also in development of their own military. Uh, and then on the other side is the Western, the Western nations that are involved in NATO and, um, and the economic system that is based on the, the, the US dollar as the reserve currency. How, how much longer do you think that the uh, dollar can handle or hang on to the reserve currency for the world? Like China has trillions in reserve currency. Russia already, the foreign minister for Russia already came, came out and said, we'll never do that again. Um, as you mentioned, they're gonna price their, their natural resources in rubles. Uh, if I, I'm referencing a, a uh, cover story from The Economist last week saying that we're, we're moving headlong into a two, like a, a two, a global system that's broken into two, into two different blocks, one autocratic and the other um, chasing uh, liberal Western values of climate change and, you know, control over big pharma after the pandemic, that kind of thing. Um, it just seems like that's uh, we put the, the entire globe on reverse <laughs> from all of the gains that we made post 1989 when, uh, when the Berlin Wall came down. Yeah, it's, it, it is all crumbling at this stage in the game. Um, and it, I mean, I think every administration, regardless if it was left or right, um, always sought world peace. Except this one, um, 
and knowing the economic problems behind this, uh, it just seems as though they they know it's going to come crashing down anyhow. Um, and they're just trying to, you know, uh, get a, a better foothold for the next one. Um, you know, our problem is, is that governments have been borrowing since World War II with no intention of ever paying anything back. Um, so the deficits are year after year after year. Um, and it, I mean, everything has changed. The, it, you know, the, um, the Fed can't even prevent inflation anymore. Uh, even back in 1970, before Brent Woods fell, if you had E-bonds or whatever, and you went to the bank, you said, gee, I'd like to borrow against them, it was illegal. All right. After Brenton Woods fell, basically, uh, you want to trade commodities, you post T-bills as collateral. All right. So suddenly the debt became money that just paid interest. Uh, so the theory that it, it was less inflationary to borrow than to print made sense before 1970 because you weren't increasing the money supply. But now the money supply is flush with bonds as well as cash. Yeah. Uh, there's no difference between the two other than the bonds pay interest. So it, it, the whole system has been so gamed that it, it's, it's a total mess. And, there, and there's no way to put this back together. Uh, the dollar will remain probably the last bastion, mainly because um, when you, you're looking at Europe, is really a basket case to begin with. But uh, the United States was bankrupt in 18, 1896. That's when JP Morgan had to lend $100 million to bail out the treasury uh, in gold. Uh, by the end of World War I, we were, had taken the title of the financial capital of the world from Britain. By the end of World War II, we had 76% of the total world gold reserves. Uh, of central banks. So <clears throat> that was all because Europe blew itself up. And so as it's doing that, the United States won, we were never invaded. Um, so all the money came here. The United States was also the greatest arms dealer, as well as the breadbasket. Um, you're not growing wheat when you got tanks running around Europe. Um, so you know, this time you have the same sort of risk that as the Europeans realize that there is um, a serious problem here uh, in Europe, uh, then, you know, the capital is going to continue to move to the dollar. But that doesn't mean the dollar ultimately survives. Uh, the idea of a reserve currency is kind of like diminishing very rapidly with uh, the collapse of, of SWIFT, really. Um, you, you will end up with probably the yuan versus the dollar. And then um, the idea is it, it be, you have the IMF in there pitching for they should create a currency. And then you have the same thing coming out of the world, you know, the, the, the uh, really the United Nations. Uh, everybody wants to be the new reserve currency. Uh, so uh, this is, you know, on the agenda, but I don't think they realize that uh, a Russian sub carries 160 nukes and it can <laughs> surface stealthily right off the, the coast of the United States. And this is a different war than World War I or World War II. Well, uh, in light of all that, um, I want to get kind of, you know, those, those are big geopolitical ideas. Um, what do individual investors who are paying attention right now uh, make of all this? What do they do with their own money in light of, uh, you know, things that are way outside of our control? Personally, I'm a stoic by philosophy, uh, and I believe that there are things you can control and things you can't. And uh, I'm interested in geopolitics, mostly because I think it's a fascinating story, but I know that I don't have any control over it. And I still have to make decisions about what to do with my money. 
my well, I think my property, you have to, my kids' education, yeah. my health care, those kinds of things. What do what do individuals make of all these big geopolitical changes? We're we're going through a massive paradigm shift in the way that the world sees itself. Yes, what what basically makes that transition. Um, for example, you could really look at Germany and the hyperinflation. Uh, what they were doing was that um, they were using foreign currencies, everybody else's but Germany. Uh, they were using uh, tangible assets, uh, everything, including art, uh, rare coins, stamps, uh, and land. In 1925, when Germany had to create a new currency, they didn't have any gold reserves. Uh, so the new currency in 1925 was backed by real estate. Um, so it's tangible assets of that nature that uh, tends to be the element that survives. Uh, it's just re-denominated in whatever new currency we end up with. Um, but uh, I would honestly, uh, you know, make sure you also stockpile food, some cans, uh, you know, pasta lasts a few years, uh, rice, things of this nature, uh, mainly because you're looking also at shortages. Yeah. Uh, and well, I think we got a, uh, we got a crash course in that during the pandemic. <laughs> and it hasn't really recovered. Supply chains are still an issue. Well, it's gotten worse also because uh, Russia and Ukraine represent 30% of the world wheat exports. Yes. Uh, so that's that's been nuts. I mean, if you've you know, last weekend, I mean, the nickel in, in London market went completely berserk um, and nickel is used for stainless steel. I mean, a lot of different things. And suddenly they go, oh, well, gee, wait a minute. Uh, all base metals and stuff. I mean, it, 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 you have to wonder when when. Biden stands up and says, we're going to put these sanctions on Russia and it will be targeted to them. Do you realize what you have really done? I mean, you've got base metals going crazy, energy going crazy. It, we're all connected globally. So shortages in energy in Europe are going to push the prices up even here. Uh, so, it, you know, I, I don't know if these people are completely stupid or, or what, you know, the people advising them are stupid. It's hard to say. But all your tangible assets uh, basically are rising right now. And that's what you see. Uh, and look, some people are paying millions of dollars for the first edition of a comic book. Uh, I wouldn't do that. But, um, you know, th this is what's going on. I mean, houses um, depends upon the area that you're in. Uh, you're seeing, you know, prices basically decline in areas of, of New York and California and rising in Texas and Florida. Uh, you also have mass migrations because of, of the COVID restrictions still. So it, it's, a, it's, it's very, very complex uh, to, to say the least. And, and you have to look at this from uh, that perspective and understand that uh, we're dealing with um, when a currency system fails, it's the tangible assets that still have the value. Okay, it's just that they get re-denominated in whatever it is that we're going to call the new currency. Um, uh, so that's what survives, uh, not necessarily the you know uh, cash deposits or, or things of this nature. Uh, and what set off the uh, the hyperinflation in Germany, most people, you know, even get that wrong. They think, oh, we're just printing money. And that wasn't. What happened was Germany got very desperate to make reparation payments in December 1922. They confiscated 10% of everybody's assets in the banks. They issued uh, bonds. You can buy them on eBay. Of course, they defaulted on them. Uh, but once they confiscated in, in what you would call forced loan, then people went, holy shit, you know, and they, they just took money out of the banks. They went everywhere other than they would no longer trust the system. And I think that's kind of what we're getting to with SWIFT uh, being turned into a political weapon. So that's already starting on a global scale. 
Um, I'd be careful also about you know cryptocurrencies. Uh, they're not the alternative to the dollar or something like that. These people have got you know guns and and tanks, and they can do whatever they want to do. So we got to we have to look at those sorts of things. Uh, if people want to hear more of your ideas, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, you can go to uh, armstrongeconomics.com. Uh, it's totally free. We don't even make you register. So we respect everybody's privacy and we, we put it out more as a <clears throat> public service. So um, you're welcome to go there and look. You can browse and search, you know, all the archives of everything that we've been publishing for, for decades. Uh, and But like I say, you don't have to register and it's free. All right. Thank you, Martin. I think we'll be talking to you again soon. Uh, things are going to be changing rapidly, I expect. Oh, I think that's very true. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. It was good to talk to you and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you.